Anna is an internationally acclaimed design anthropologist and psychologist, known for pioneering the people-centric approach to innovation and change management, who has worked for companies such as Microsoft and Boeing. She runs her own consultancy, Kiroko, in Norway. So I heard Anna speak at a conference in Lisbon last year, and I was really inspired by her passionate message of the power of transdisciplinary work, putting egos aside, breaking down the disciplinary rules. Now, more than ever, we need to come together to solve the huge challenges we face. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, um, I'm terrible with technology despite working at Microsoft. So I'm going to try and set up uh, so I can also switch uh, slides. Let's see, how does this thing work? Let's see if I do it. Yay. OK, there we are. Um, well, I just want to say very briefly something, because uh, in this presentation, you're going to see a transformation in the work that I do and what I thought in the past and how I think now. But I've spent my whole life transcending boundaries and living and working on the edge. I grew up in Asia and learned to understand cultures at an early age, even before I could understand what was happening with myself or the people around me. And I became one of the first practitioners of anthropology and corporations. In the early years, it was Lucy Suchman, Genevieve Bell, and myself. And we were exploring the world of technology in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And many, many anthropologists have joined us and surpassed us since then. And reflecting now on those years, what allowed me to do the work I did was an incredibly strong sense of ethics I acquired du during my studies of anthropology. The people-centered approach came from critical analysis of working with corporations. I started the approach when I was the lead design anthropologist at Microsoft. And the goal all the time was to ensure corporations are making products and services and even organizational changes that are meaningful, relevant, useful, and desirable for the people we serve. Who do these companies serve? It should be their customers and potential customers and their employees. The people-centered approach requires involving all beneficiaries of a service in the design and development of said service. This was how to mitigate the ethical and moral obligations corporations should have. Over the years, I've worked in public sectors, private sectors, governments, and non-governmental agencies all over the world, all the while maintaining something very dear to my heart, my integrity. And this was not always easy, and I had battles lost, and battles won, and battles I have I've completely walked away from. However, there was one industry I refused to work with, and that was the pharmaceutical industry. I despise pharmaceuticals. They up prices when needs arise. They gain monetary value from the suffering of others. The rich pay, and the poor go without. Let me just give you one little personal example. Last year, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer. She lived in a state where assisted suicide was allowed. But as soon as it became legal, this pharmaceutical industry upped the price of her one pill from $2 to $5,000. From $2 to $5,000. And there is a cheaper version at $500, which would burn her throat when she took it. Imagine giving your mom her last gin and tonic and it burned her throat when it goes down because you could not afford paying $5,000. We paid the $5,000 held hostage by the industry. And I just ask, seriously? We allow this to happen, we, all of us. I consider this morally and ethically irresponsible. But we have new problems today, new ethical dilemmas that Alex and I will use the rest of our time on. Alex, I'll introduce in a minute, is going to show you just how hard it is today to avoid being complicit with immoral and unethical practice today. But first, I want to tell you the story of my iPhone. This summer, my kin came to Norway, the last three of them. I only have three left. They had never been to Norway, and 
They had Norwegian ancestry and wanted to go to their family homestead. I had planned carefully a three-week road trip and stored every single detail on my precious phone. I added all the apps I needed to navigate the three weeks, all the tickets, all the places to stay, my banking needs, absolutely everything. Only as we left my driveway, my phone died. It just stopped working. I ignored the problem at first because I was so sure it would not fail me. It did. Desperate, at the next big city, I went to the Apple store. I spoke with three people, three different employees, and they all insisted that I call one telephone number, their special, special number for tech support, Apple support. And six hours of time went by the phone could not be revived, and they were going to give me a new one if I could give them a password I did not have with me. If I had two Apple devices, problem would be solved, but I only had one. On the phone with the Apple support, in the Apple store, the support guy used NLP tactics. If you don't know what those are, that's when they say very condescendingly, now Anne. Yeah. Which only made things worse. I wanted to punch him. <laughs> he told me that he couldn't help me because the system had taken over. It took me a full hour to get him to tell me what the system was. He told me the system would tell me in 24 hours when I would be able to change the password. Not that I could do it in 24 hours but it would tell me when I could do it. And I asked him, well, does that mean it could be one day, one hour, two weeks, one year? What, what is it? And he said he didn't know the answer because the system had taken control. And I finally got him to use the term AI. The system, I waited those 24 hours, the system determined I had to wait 18 days because I did not have another Apple device. So. I'm going to ask you some questions here. Who owns my data? All the data I had stored on that little device. Is it ethical that I should have to have or purchase another Apple device to be able to log in? I feel like I signed away the rights to my baby daughter when I signed an agreement with Apple sometime two years ago. And there's the other third challenge I have, that the piece of shit falls apart after a couple of years, and how often are you buying yourself a mobile phone? The real Me Too campaign is not about gender inequality. It's when technology solutions drive corruption and when solutions are not focused on the people we serve. I'm here today because I believe in people and their needs in their everyday lives. It's about attitudes. It's about our actions. Technology is supposed to enable us, not irritate us, frustrate us or even harm us. I believe in the people in this audience, although it's diminishing, <laughs> but I believe that we can and should make a difference in our lives. But as Rolf has said, it's no longer just about people. It's no longer about being people-centered. It's also about our planet. My whole career has been about fixing shitty services and products or coming up with meaningful and relevant new products and services for the people I serve. I actually did not fix anything. As an anthropologist, I facilitated change by unveiling, as an anthropologist does, different truths. Anthropologists are good at seeing things from different perspectives. And now we live in a time of turbulence where technology is growing at an exponential rate and we humans are not. It's time we unveil some new truths. For someone who has worked with computing and digita digitalization since before, during, and after the introduction of the World Wide Web, I'm puzzled by the overglorified approach of introducing technologies blindly without thinking strategically about ethics and value. And when I speak of value, I am not thinking monetarily. We need to use our skills to better humanity and to better the chances of planetary survival. Paul Larson, the 87-year-old man on the left in this picture, is the leading world expert on space law. 
he introduced me to the Kessler syndrome. He is using the last years of his life to try to save us from the Kessler syndrome. What is it? It's about the garbage of outer space. Every one of us in this audience is responsible for this garbage as long as we carry our mobile phones around as extensions of self. We shoot up satellites every day without questioning where they go or what they do when they break down. Just like the islands of garbage in our oceans, the Kessler syndrome is about the gathering of garbage in outer space that will collide with the equipment we need to survive and which at worst will shut down the world. I'm so lucky to have met Alex Moltzow this past spring. He was embarking on a journey into the unknown. On June 3rd this year, he published his first blog. Anthropologists are extremely good at diving into the unknowns, transforming unknowns into comprehensible bites and showing that we believe uh, th that which we believe is known is actually not known. Alex has, for the last 120 days, shown us all how to dive into the unknown and begin to make sense of it. He has not only dived deep, but chosen to write a new article each and every day to share with all disciplines. This is the fundamental key to transcending disciplines. We have to know and understand each other. Alex, I'd like to invite you up on stage and tell us a bit about what you found out. Hello, uh, I have the second one. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Alex uh, Maltzo. Uh, I'm a student at the University of Oslo uh, studying anthropology and computer science. Uh, I believe more anthropologists uh, should learn to code uh, to tackle the issues we have been discussing today. Anthropologists have been learning new languages for quite a while and programming languages are now necessary to learn. Um, Anna mentioned we are good at diving into the unknown. Uh, that's how we become anthropologists. As anthropologists, we're also good at connecting the dots. I want to share my journey in connecting the dots, uh, what I have found so far, diving deep into artificial intelligence, uh, where we as social scientists and technologists need to be together. Uh, this uh, slide is actually uh, a greeting to the technologists uh, in the room. Uh, maybe there's not that many left. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, trust as an individual consequence of the use of artificial intelligence. If we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, it's impossible not to talk about data. So let me start with a story about my father-in-law. He died a few years ago of acute kidney failure. When it happens, it happens fast, and it's quite difficult to stop the regression. Today, we can accurately predict kidney failure two days in advance of its occurrence. This is due to the advances in the field of artificial intelligence, and specifically through the work done at DeepMind here in the United Kingdom. But there is a problem. In order for DeepMind to predict kidney failure, they had to illegally use 1.6 million British people's health data. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? On the one hand, this could have saved my father-in-law's life. On the other hand, could this data also be misused? The answer is yes, it could. The current corporate practice, or malpractice as you will, is to track all of your data and then maybe tell you about it later, especially when they are in court. That's a great time to tell you. Uh, this is track and tell. Track first, tell later. When Mark Zuckerberg told us Facebook was using all the messages you sent to your friends to help target advertising, that's something we did not expect. How do many of us think this is OK. We as individuals consent almost every day to this track and tell practice in order to access the lives of friends and family, and even just access some services we find interesting. You take a DNA test, 
you connect it to all sorts of uh, relatives. Uh, your data can also determine uh, your current health and future health. Uh, this is Anna's uh, 23 uh, and me data. Uh, she submitted out of curiosity. Um, what Anna did not realize uh, it, uh, that this is called uh, data baiting. This is when we get something meaningful in return for our personal data. You do not currently decide who this data is sold to. What if this data gets in the hands of a health insurance company when you need in order to pay your doctor bills? What if they determined you're not eligible for insurance? Perhaps even your data is sold to the company you hate the most. <laughs> In our extremely short collaboration, Alex Googled 23andMe and laughed his head off when he showed me this. This is a $300 million partial acquisition by a pharmaceutical of 23andMe. There is nothing altruistic about this. No one pays $300 million for angel behavior. This means that I basically paid, I paid 23andMe to spit into a test tube and now a pharmaceutical is spitting in my face with my own spit. This is not what I wanted or even thought about when I paid 23andMe. Uh, these stories are uh, all about the dilemmas around data citizenship. Who owns our data? Who can use it? When can we access it? And who benefits from our data? Uh, with great amounts of data come great amounts of responsibility, and this is where the dilemma lies. Trust is the data dilemma. We want to contribute to positive insight, yet it can be used for adverse effects. We ha have to consider more carefully the societal consequences, especially with artificial intelligence. That is why OpenAI was uh, created, funded with $1 billion by Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. Uh, it was originally created as a non-profit. You know Elon Musk and his Tesla cars and space rockets. But did you know uh, what Peter is up to? Uh, he owns Palantir. Uh, and what does Palantir do? Palantir is data analysis for governments, mostly for the military and uh, security. We need to understand who is vested in evaluating if technology is good or bad. This definition of AI safety is made by OpenAI. Uh, we can already here argue uh, there's a series of problems. One could say the definition itself is far too narrow because people want to do a lot of things. The MIT Media Lab scandal has so many layers to it, from gender inequality and bias towards the wealthy. We have to have a discussion amidst ourselves on what we want to achieve and why we want to achieve it. We need the right laws in place to police how and why people and businesses are funding the advancement of technologies, most often for humans. Stanford also is trying to attract billion dollars, and this will partly go towards building frameworks to evaluate what is good or what is bad in the field of AI. Will they go down the rabbit hole as MIT Media Lab did? The danger is that the source of funding may not be as explicit as Epstein, a convicted sex offender and human trafficker. Today, the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI is funded by Microsoft. What are the mitigating factors to avoid what happened at MIT? We don't know. This is also dominated by another challenge this institute and others also has, bias white males in their 40s and 50s. Deep. Sorry for those of you in the audience who are in that age and are white. <laughs> yeah. Apologies. Sorry. Yeah. D DeepMind is building tools to evaluate algorithms too. They have a working project called BSuit with open source software from OpenAI and other working groups in Google. To evaluate algorithm performance sounds great. However, in practice, this means Google, which owns DeepMind, could be evaluating Google. Facebook recently funded an ethics institute in Munich, too. We want these companies to not be evil. However, when tobacco was funding health research, when mining companies measure spills in rivers, when oil companies measure oil spills, and so on, you get the picture. 
Amazon is one of the most irresponsible tech companies in the world because they have not given a damn about the climate crisis. It is so ironic that they are called Amazon. <laughs> they are one of the highest percentages of coal utilization. They use it for data centers and logistics. Refrigeration was mentioned as one of the leading causes in terms of materials and the climate crisis. Materials used in refrigeration alone can lower our carbon footprint by nearly 90 gigatons. This is enormous. As individuals, by the way, streaming video online counts for the highest use of energy on the internet. By 2025, connected devices will consume one-fifth of the world's energy. That energy better be renewable. Yet we often do not know where Amazon has their data centers. Who works there? Are they well taken care of? How can we know that Amazon's statements are true? It is said that data will become the new oil. Data, well, it has. Why is all this so important? We cannot have this happening in technology. Not now. 15th of March this year, I took this picture in Oslo. There were children and youth in the streets holding cardboard signs up high and laughing. Some were crying. I thought to myself that day that I'd never seen anything like it before. In the history of humanity, there has never been quite a moment like this. And it happened partly due to the connections we have made through technology. So what is AI safety really? making artificial intelligence work for our shared ecology. As Roloff already has said, there have been protests all across the world and is no longer only children and youth. The protests took place across four and a half thousand locations in 150 countries with more than 7.6 million people participating. This is unequivocally the largest climate protest that has happened simultaneously in our history. Because the rules have to be changed. We need a system change rather than individual change, but you cannot have one without the other. And so I ask you to please wake up and make the changes required possible. To do your best is no longer good enough. We must do all the seemingly impossible. Everything needs to change, and it has to start today. These are single child's words posted on one of the most important buildings in the world, the United Nations. Would they risk posting this if it were not true? So what can we do? This is what we heard today, and we're trying to sum it all up. Julian told us we must question doing good with AI and explained the need of the transdisciplinary approach to achieve this. Simon Roberts discussed embodiment that we need to experience people other than our own to guide us. Intelligence needs bodies. Joanna Bryson, this is a quote, if we legislate and educate for accountability, transparency will follow. The responsibility is already ours. Gloria Gonzalez is talking about us all being friends. How do we ensure supervision of data by true independent authorities? We must focus on data-intensive research at the intersections of technology, law and society, and technology, and law and gender. Rol Rolf is talking about solving together the climate crisis and creating an equitable world with technologies. Let's see what we can do together tomorrow morning. <laughs> we need to be very clear here. We're not afraid of technology. We love the possibilities. Today we, all have the, uh, today, we have all the technologies um, already created, or we know they are feasible to stop the climate crisis. We are afraid of what people will do with technology when we don't think about the consequences of it. We are afraid of what people will not do with technology because it's not in their personal monetary interest. And we cannot have and negative feedback loops in technology. Not now, not anymore. And so we need to stop hiring people just like ourselves. 
people who have the same background, the same subject matter expertise, the same ethnicity, age, and gender. These are three uh, gentlemen leaders of the same company. <clears throat> I, won't, I, need, I need say no more, I think. Um, after all, it's said that like-minded children may play best together, but they learn nothing. No one discipline will succeed at the wicked problems of today. We need to start seeing things from different perspectives so we get the big picture, and then we need to dive deep down into the unknown. We need to collaborate. We need to insist on new policies, new laws, new taxes, new rules of engagement, new ways of thinking. We must transcend existing models and practices. We know they no longer work. The only way I know how to do this is to get lost in the woods. You have to admit that your truths are only assumptions and your job is to go beyond today's truths. The goal of getting lost in the woods is to find a path or to create a new one. And unfortunately, I have no easy way for you to do this. If you're struggling with my analogy, let me try to explain the lamp with the lamp metaphor. A lamp shines bright. The strongest light is what we know we know. The less strong light is what we know we don't know. Darkness is where we must go. It's what we don't know we don't know we need to know. And then finally, there's the lamp post. It's one of my personal favorites. What we know but refuse to see even when it's right in front of our nose. If one young woman can change the world, imagine what we in this room can do if we put our minds uh, to it. Alex is here because he's one of my heroes. In just 120 days, he's connected dots I could not imagine. He has helped me see what I could not see, and he has helped me understand the unknown unknowns and the unknown knowns right under my nose. What Alex and I both agree upon, we need to stop futuring. This is our moment to transcend disciplinary boundaries. No one discipline will make it on its own. We need each other and we need to work together and we need to combine social sciences, politics, humanities, government, and STEM together to tr transcend these boundaries. Alex and I came to this conference because Don brought us together to do what we must do, not what we can do. Don't leave here today without setting your personal goal to transcend disciplinary boundaries. Start talking and acting together in the present. Why? The future is now. It's our collective responsibility, and we don't have time. Thank you. <laughs>